Good morning. Happy New Year. Almost. Before I start um, speaking about the New Year um, and what we do with it, maybe a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the Practice Council and I have decided that we want to offer what we will call an everyday Zen practice period starting on January 20th and going for three months. And we want it to be a framework in which you, if you decide to participate, can deepen or intensify or extensify your practice um, based on an individual schedule. Like you, you make intentions and commitments within a framework of doing it together. And there'll be some intensives and a seminar and Dharma weekends that I want to dedicate to Dogen's celebrated famous text, the Genjo Koan, which is um, sometimes translated as the Koan of everyday life, which is central to our lineage. and have a study group if you want to participate in that and maybe also help you learn to study Dogen and not feel so alienated by his writing. <laughs> anyway, there will be information that we send out um, shortly after New Year's Day and um, if you have questions you can write to us or talk to me about it. Okay. When I was younger, I was quite influenced by the key concepts of um, Hannah Arendt, the philosopher. <clears throat> and she, uh, especially I was influenced by her distinction between power and violence and um, her definitions of action, fabrication, and labor, which sort of gave me a landscape of understanding better what, what uh, human beings are doing, you know, acting, fabricating things, laboring. And there's another notion that is completely central to her work, um, natality the fact that we are born. <clears throat> and she connects it with, um, very much with our capacity to act. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of a philosophically charged notion. It means that um, the capacity to act means that we have the capacity to begin anew that we have the ability to step out of the usual course of action, habits, established rules, and um, have a fresh start, initiate something. And this has had a great influence for her, uh, on her political philosophy, like that there can be revolutions, that groups of people can gather and create power between them. Power is the ability to act together. Um, and give themselves a new constitution, a new way of doing things. <clears throat> so, since we're, you know, getting very close to the new year, I was reminded of this, this uh, capacity to begin anew. <clears throat> I uh, recently talked with a Sangha friend and she said to me um, that she thought that of all the holidays, you know, New Year's was really poorly celebrated in America. It's like blow up stuff and drink. 
basically. And it's so hard to know. There's no event, right? It's like, it's just like the clock is like going to 12 a.m. tomorrow. And then, and then there's the new year. Like there's no event. You have to drop a giant ball in Times Square to notice something's happening, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be anything happening. <clears throat> I have to have a countdown and a ball. If the excitement of explosions and, you know, getting drunk is going to be, you know, the harbinger of the new... I don't know. It's not very inspiring. Anyway, that's what she thought. So I'm just repeating it here. <laughs> Maybe it's true. <laughs> she also reminded me of um, how, the, how there's a different approach in Japan. There's this tradition... I, I haven't experienced it, I just read about it now that she reminded me of it. I, I sort of knew about this, but uh, there's a big cleaning that happens in preparation for the new year, and families and companies and schools and institutions uh, engage in giving attention to areas that usually don't, are not cleaned, or, and you pick up every object, and I'm exaggerating maybe, but ask yourself, is this, does this need to be here? You know, you declutter. What is unnecessary can leave the house. And you prepare the space to welcome the energies of the new year so that they have, that they're not bogged down by the dirt and the what's left over in the negativity of the old year. I think that's quite, quite inspiring. This is like, I thought maybe we should do this as a group and individually and so forth. You know, like spring cleaning, but for the new year. Now, I, so I read a couple of articles about this just to get a feeling for it. It's not easy, you know, you can't just invent culture. It's like, you can't just say like, oh yeah, let's, let's do this in America. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you can, you know, we, maybe we can decide. can have a revolution. Decide that we want to set new customs and rules for how to... Uh, engaged New Year's. And <coughs> both, both articles that I read spoke about how it's not just about the physical space, it's also symbolic of a um, cleaning of the mind. Whenever Westerners talk about symbolic, when it comes to ritual, I'm always like, uh, something's not understood here. When you say something, you know, you perform an action and it symbolizes something else, then you're basically implying it's only a ritual. <clears throat> it's just a ritualistic thing that you do, but it means something else. Well, the way I was initiated into Buddhist ritual, there's no symbolism. It's all an enactment. It's an embodiment. You are doing something, and that doing has an effect in the world, on your body, on your mind, in the community, and so forth. It's not symbolic. I mean, there are deeper layers of understanding that we may have to uncover. It's, it's like... If you say it's symbolic, you make a distinction between the physical body and space and, and the mind. They're like separate things, and you do something in the physical realm to symbolize something in the mental realm. But a Buddhist understanding, as far as I can tell, is that body and mind are not separate. So when you do something... Um, Physically, it 
has an, uh, an expression in the mind. And when you do something with the mind, it will express itself in your space. I mean your physical space, how you live, the space, the social space you're in, the political space, and you know, all of it. <clears throat> You know, I think we have that notion, you know, if we um, we walk into someone's living space, it's an expression of their mind in a certain degree, right? You can separate yourself now. Oh, my mind is quite separate from this space. Well, you think so. But something expresses itself through how you choose to live. Um, when I practiced monastically, we would be doing a 90-day practice period. Basically, around the time that I'm proposing, we, or we're proposing we're going to have a, not an ongo practice period, but what we want to call an everyday Zen practice period, not monastic, but with a certain kind of intention. But, you know, monastically, the 90-day practice period was structured by five-day weeks, and every five days you would have a day with a lighter schedule and more personal time. And the day before that, there was a ninju ceremony, which I was taught to be a re-entry ceremony. Okay, so we were re-entering a clean zendo. So there was an effort to clean the zendo communally, and also clean the kitchen and the workshop and um, the office. You know, clean, declutter. We'd be doing it every five days. And you were also um, expected to clean your personal room. I think many people skipped over that. It just seemed unnecessary. Or you didn't, you didn't want to make the effort or find the time to do it. But it was basically the afternoon. It was just cleaning and reorganizing. And, and then you would set out an altar in each of the areas, work areas in the kitchen and the workshop and the zendo and uh, the office. And then we would have a procession every five days, have a procession go around the premises and offer incense at each altar to acknowledge the newly configured space and then go into the zendo and you know the leader of the practice period would go around the zendo inspect the cleanliness and then we chant and renew our vows and so forth <clears throat> so it's interesting it's like you can enact this once a year before the turn of the year or you can enact it every five days. Or, what about you enact it every moment? A new beginning. I mean, the ritual suggests that we could live our life in a way of letting go of leftover stuff, clutter, negativity, and begin anew in each moment. So Suzuki Roshi, you know, his book titled Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, I mean, he's kind of equating Zen mind with a beginner's mind. There's this caption, you know, that prefaces the book, in the beginner's mind there are many possibilities, in the expert's minds there are few. So... It, it, it initially has a different vibe. It's sort of like, it's about what is the expert's mind? The expert's mind is like you have expert knowledge 
in some area, like you know how something is, how something works, how something needs to be done. And it's sort of like, it sounds like a put down, the expert's mind, but boy, to know about something is very empowering. You know how to build something. And you can build it. If you don't know how to build it, you can't build it. <laughs> um, but, and this is something to observe, and not, again, not as a put-down, just as a study of our own aliveness. It's like when you have expert knowledge, it's also limiting. Because once you have a routine, you're prone to just keep doing it that way. You know what I mean, right? I mean, I could give examples. One that comes to mind is, you know, we have two volunteers who are folding the laundry for the Boulder Guest House, which I'm very grateful for. And, um, you know, there's a certain form that we have established, how to fold the towels, how to fold the flat sheets, how to fold the fitted sheets, how to fold the pillowcases, and so forth, right? It's like, it's a certain way. And then it fits into the closet, and you can organize, and the closet looks organized and can be, when more than one person is involved in doing something, it's, it's nice to have a form. Now, if you want to, as soon as you do something with attention to detail, more details emerge. You can always refine your form. The other day I was talking to Petraea, was one of the Volunteers. There was the other one. Um, she's like I was talking to her, and then because I was there, I was helping her with the big fitted sheets. And you know, I folded laundry for many years as the guest manager in the monastery. It's like I've learned to like it, <clears throat> but it's cumbersome. You have these like big sheets, and they don't fit. Like you can't have a table big enough, and, and like. Your arms are not wide enough, so it's, you know, anyway, it's a bit complicated. And you want to do it well. Anyway, she said, oh, we have to turn this around. Like, here's the, the, the right side, the top of the fitted sheet, you know, it's like, it needs to be like this. And then I fold it like that. And when it comes together and it's this package, then the housekeeper can just take it and open it and throw it onto the bed. And if I do it the other way, you know, when she throws it, it's going to land the wrong way. But you have to think about it, right? Because if you throw it, it has to be the wrong side up because then it folds, the top sheet folds over and, you know, like that. So you could dismiss all this as unnecessary, but if you are fully engaged in your... Uh, in the particulars of your actions, you become an expert in how to fold the laundry. And then if somebody comes in and says, like, oh, I can fold the laundry, and it's like, and you're like, no, not like this. You get upset or something. <coughs> so the beginner's mind is glorified here, but it's also kind of could lead to some pretty shabby results, you know. The beginner is like just throwing stuff together and it's like, oh God, now the closet looks like it's a mess. And the housekeeper complains and so forth. Okay, so let's be careful about what we're, what we're wishing for. <laughs> Don't want to just um, dismiss all the experts. But, when you get entrenched in your ideas about how things are and how they should be, you may lose an openness for how things could be otherwise.
And then you live inside of a pattern. And there's a loss of freedom and freshness. And um, a loss of the ability to learn. I want to come back to what I mean by that. It's like to be open to the complexity of a situation so that the, that complexity can actually instruct you or re-instruct you. Because if you approach everything with, well, that's how I deal with this complexity, then aspects of that complexity are actually invisible to you. Does that make sense? So it sounds like a simple thing I keep a beginner's mind, but I think it's it's very deep and profound. And then on top of that, you know, to practice this moment after moment continuously. We can bring back uh, Hannah Arendt's idea of natality, like my Buddhist version of this understanding is not, not that we are born once, <coughs> but that our life is continuous birth. At each moment, all the causes and conditions, the complexity of a situation, is coming together and gives birth to this moment. And it also is continuous death. Because as the new moment emerges, something falls away and becomes the past. There's always loss. Continuous loss and continuous newness. Continuous birthing is the activity of the world. How can we, no, how can you serve Surf that. <laughs> Beginner's mind. <clears throat> so, there's in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, there's a chapter um, named Emptiness. And Suzuki Roshi says there, when you study Buddhism, you should have a general house cleaning of your mind. So he seems to be picking up on the, you know, big New Year's cleaning and, and says like, yeah, we can have this big cleaning of our mind. And he says, you um, need to forget. <coughs> you need to forget about all of your preconceived ideas. I preconceived ideas, that's the expert knowledge. <coughs> and then he gives some examples. It's like you need to give up your idea of uh, existence. Hmm? And you need to give up your idea of substantiality. That things remain the same. And you need to give up your hope for the future. Because if you have hope for the future, like some idea about how the future will be, you are not able to seriously engage with the present. Okay. So, there's some house cleaning going on here. <laughs> Fundamental notions of existence, life, time, space. This is to study Buddhism. Take those out one by one and examine them. Then he says, you might want to bring some things back in. There's a lot of complexity here. It's like you can, he's, he's just talking around the idea of the two truths. It's like none of these notions are actually, you know, are actually the way the world is. You need to take them out 
don't believe in them. Don't believe in them. And you can bring them back in for practical purposes. You know, it's fine to talk about the self or people or existence. But you should know that you can't set up shop in these notions. They're empty. This is also maintaining a beginner's mind around any kind of notion, any kind of conceptual framework that we build. It's not the final world, it's not a word, it's not always so, as he said. It's not always so. So I I was appreciating feeling out this this sense of forgetting, forgetting all your preconceived ideas. You know, can we have a practice of forgetting is the question that I had. Forgetting is a kind of involuntary thing. If you try to forget something actively, you're remembering it as you're trying to forget it. <laughs> There's something indirect about forgetting. So how, how, to, how can you make an art out of this? But I also thought, I was asking myself, it's like forgetting, you know, most people think of forgetting as a kind of loss, as something negative, it's not something you want to practice. But this house cleaning idea is, you know, you are, you actually want to forget about the past so that you're open to the future. I asked ChatGBT, which I didn't. <laughs> just as I don't use it much, but now and then I just think. I asked ChatGPT, like, is it better to remember or to forget the past? <laughs> and when you ask value questions to ChatGPT, it always does the same thing. It's like, oh, there's some good things about remembering, and there's some good things about forgetting, and it just depends on the situation. It's like, okay, thank you, I knew that. Um, I guess there's, anyway. There may be knowledge in ChatGPT, uh, but maybe not wisdom. There's a, I don't know who it is attributed to, it comes from some philosophers, like those who, f who don't remember their past are prone to repeat it, something like this become a pretty common saying. There's some valuing of, the, of remembrance there. You know? Yeah, I mean, some truth to it, right? If you just are oblivious of history, you may make the same mistakes. But even if you know your history, you may still make your mistakes. On the other hand, when, um, when we dwell on certain memories, we really occupy our mind, clutter it in a way, frame it a certain way, and uh, I th I'm, I'm afraid that a certain way of remembering your life actually, and a cer certain kind of storytelling might close you off to a beginner, from a beginner's mind and makes it, makes it more difficult to begin a new And this um, ongoing horrible conflict between um, Israel and Hamas. Um, I heard Yuval Harari, this um, Israeli historian and Jewish, Israeli Jewish historian and philosopher, best selling author. Some of you might have read, read his books. I heard him uh, say that 
conflicts cannot be resolved by pointing out the past to each other. <clears throat> they can only be resolved by looking toward a common future. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, there's wisdom in that. If you want to be right about what happened and seek recognition for the injuries that have happened to you, which have happened, <clears throat> but they've happened on both sides, then it's, it's an endless debate. Who began, who was right and wrong, and then it's difficult to move forward from that. So this most intractable conflict in the world, it seems, is, uh, I think, teaching that lesson. <clears throat> Again. But it's, it shows up in our personal life, too. So, as I was um, contemplating the, uh, the question of forgetting, how do you forget the past? How do you forget what happened to you? The bad things, the negative stuff, the harm. How do you forget it? How do you <clears throat> let it go so that you clear the way for a new beginning? <clears throat> if something is deeply rooted in um, the body, trauma in other words, I've spoken about trauma before, my view of it, um, it's not possible to forget. The body will remind you. Even unconsciously it will remind you because there are uh, deep-seated, um, unbearable sensations that haven't been metabolized adequately. And metabolized means that in, the intensity of those sensations hasn't been passed through the body um, sufficiently, so it's encapsulated and it gets, you know, reactivated again and again. <clears throat> so forgetting isn't just like a mental exercise, like, oh, just forget something. It's a full body um, and mind letting go. It means like, you need to revisit that which wasn't fully metabolized. You need to be willing to open up to that which is still painful. It's like that pain that wasn't fully metabolized isn't in the past. It's actually in the present. Which made me um, aware of, uh, um, in myself, the question of forgiveness. <clears throat> now, forgiveness is, in our culture, is pretty loaded with Christian ideas. And so some people will like say, like, ah, nah, I don't want to hear about forgiveness. I'm one of these people. Um, but over the years, you know, I had to, like forget about my preconceived ideas and just open myself up to the phenomenon of forgiveness. What is going on? Like, what is actually happening? Now, one thing that I think is pretty important to notice is when you forgive someone, you're not liberating them. <clears throat> you're liberating yourself. If you are the injured party, right, you are carrying around blame, accusation, grudge. It's burdening me when I have this stuff. It's, it's, it's weighing on me. 
it's limiting my life. And it costs energy to maintain this separation from other people who have done wrong to you. It's like to maintain that blame, to maintain that grudge, is a constant effort that has to be made. So, to forgive is to let it go, to unburden yourself. It's not for the other person. Well, by unburdening yourself in this way, something may open up in the relationship too, but... See, if you have done harm, if you've injured someone else, the appropriate, the appropriate um, action is, is apology. It's different. They go hand in hand. If somebody apologizes adequately, it's easier to forgive. If somebody forgives, it's easier to apologize. So we make, we make it easier for another person if we forgive for them to apologize. Now, I want to um, briefly mention this to you because it's important to me and to make it more practical. I've, this is coming from somewhere. It's like somebody told me this and I've made it my own and my own version of it. <clears throat> But when I need to engage actively in uh, forgiveness, Joko Beck says, you know, we all have a list of people we haven't forgiven. And uh, it's like, you might want to make that list and you want to, may, may want to uh, work on whether you for, can forgive these people on your list. And she says, it, some things are basically unforgivable. Murder, rape, you know, very difficult. Let's be clear about that. But you can observe where you draw the line, what is forgivable, what is not forgivable, and, and move your line. Because if you keep, you keep many things as unforgivable, you practice separation. Separateness. So I say, even though I blame you for, now you have to be specific, even though I blame you for betraying me, <clears throat> I, anything, whatever the injury is, um, I forgive you with my whole body and mind. Because... I now realize that you were unable, unwilling, or didn't know better how to act differently. You have to make a choice. Was the person unable, unwilling, or did they not know better? There's always one of those three applies magically. And then, so you decide, you say, because you were, you didn't want to, you were unwilling to act differently. Somebody exercised their free will. I now realize that this is so. <clears throat> and I leave, and I, and I leave the responsibility for that with you. This is how you unburden yourself. I leave the responsibility with you. You did this. I didn't do it. And from now on, I stand by that. Now, in my experience, when people encourage forgiveness, have encouraged me to practice forgiveness, it's always completely nebulous, you know. It's like, oh, forgive, and then it's like, oh, and then you can't do it. And it's like, oh. <clears throat> if you study this, what I just said, it's very specific. You have to be precise about what the injury is. It's not nebulous grudge. It's like, this happened. 
this is what I am not for, haven't been forgiving. And um, but now I have the intention to forgive you with my whole body and mind. Now it's so now I will do it based on a realization. And the realization is that the person was unable to act differently, didn't want to act differently, or didn't know better. It's like when uh, Thich Nhat Hanh speaks about understanding or looking deeply, it's like understanding breeds compassion, is what he says often. It's like, yeah, what kind of understanding? Oh, you are unable to do this differently. Hmm. This is compassion. If somebody is unable to do something differently, the only thing that makes sense is to teach them, not to blame them. If somebody is unwilling, and this is actually what's happening, then they're exercising their free will. And if that's harmful to me, we may need to separate. Because if that's what your intention is, it's not working for me. Fine. That's okay. Um, if somebody didn't know better, no, actually, I wanted to say, if somebody's unable, if that's a permanent condition, there's nothing you can do. <clears throat> it's like if you blame a child for something, you know, and they're unable, yeah, maybe you can teach them, but if it's not the right age, there's nothing you can do. It just happens. It's just... But when somebody doesn't know better, then you can try to teach. <coughs> Appeal to insight. And then, I now leave the responsibility with you. Give it back where it belongs. When the person feels that something is actually given back to them, they might, when that weighs on them, feel the need to apologize. <coughs> That's not in my power. It has to happen in them. In the meantime, I can have a new beginning. I make it sound like this. It's a deep process. You may have to repeat it a number of times. Forgetting, forgiving, maybe sometimes in order to forget, we actually have to forgive first, or else the forgetting doesn't work. Forgetting is something like, once you release your resistance to what has happened, it can fade into the past. As long as there is a resistance, as the saying goes, if you resist, it persists. If you resist, the memory comes back up again and again. <clears throat> One last idea with the, around this new beginning. Someone recently asked me about purpose. You know, I don't feel a real purpose in my life. Like, well, after all these years, now I'm this old and there's no purpose. Shock. Shit. Oh no. You know, sometimes people go on a retreat. They go into the mountains or, you know, a spa. It's a new, it's the, our way of retreating. And um, they want to go by themselves, leave all uh, distractions behind, go deep inside and find their true purpose, their true self. You, you've heard of this? Maybe I'm wrong, but I think this almost never works. And there's a reason for why it never works. Maybe it has worked for you, then I apologize for this strong statement. Um, the reason it almost never works is because the purpose is not an entity that resides in you as an entity. It's not some inside thing. Purpose arises from engagement with a situation. 
It is in the response to something that is calling you. When something actually calls you and you respond fully, then you're finding purpose. And if something hasn't fully called us, then there's no, pur- no meaning, no purpose. It's okay. Now, interestingly, we could say, oh, I don't want to be so purposeless, so meaningless. Yeah, maybe. I understand the sentiment. But if you give up the resistance, it's sort of like you just open yourself up to that feeling. It's like that, with, with a beginner's mind, you could say, it's sort of like in that emptiness, in that vacuum of purpose, maybe there's a new energy for looking what actually matters, what you really care about. So Sukhirisha says, we each must make our own way. <clears throat> this is not... There is nothing ready-made for us. There is nothing prepared for us. No meaning, no purpose. It's not lying around. It's not something you find in other people. Like, oh, this person is doing it this way. I should do it this way too. No, it's unique to us. The way we respond. The way we are called. Because our circumstances are different. It's so complex. This is actually what Hannah Arendt means with natality. She doesn't mean just, oh, you're born. Like, no, you are born with very specific circumstances and particularities. And that is the new beginning. This is what you begin with. This is what you have been responding to all your life. So it's like to hold our mind in a way that allows us to respond to the, to the um, complexity and texture of our particular circumstances is the way that we will make our own way. And then Suzuki Rashi says, when you make your own way, then this will be perceived as the universal way. Because each being, each living being, has to make their own way in the circumstances. Each plant, each animal, each human being. So, when I started to, you know, because it's the new year, people want to make New Year's rev- resolutions, I asked myself, you know, what are my intentions? What are the current intentions that I'm working with? You know, I'm trying, they're working already, I'm just trying to make them conscious. And I'm noticing, oh yeah, you know, I've shared this with some of you, I want to cook more for more people. I don't know, where's this coming from? Oh, it's because I want to uh, develop a food culture because I want this, this social space of sharing meals and it's, it's something I'm missing. So an intention arises from that. And then, you know, am I awake enough? Do I have a beginner's mind to notice that this has quite a lot of power in me? You know, so, yeah. I want to make a zero-carbon campus here for the Boulder Zen Center because it's just time. Like, we have to get away from fossil fuels. So, it's not like it's going to happen later. Okay. I've done it in Creston. Now I want to do it here, too. Yeah, that. And I want to do this practice period with you because I feel it's... We need to figure out how to establish practice in a... in a in our everyday lives. How do we do it? It's an open question. Just, you know, just engage it. So, intentions and purpose don't have to be grand. They are just arising from maintaining a beginner's mind around the specificity of your circumstances. And then something arises if you are not stuck in the old ways, habits and rules. It's maybe a very, very quiet thing. Barely noticeable. It's just, you, we have to forget and forgive and declutter to have the sensitivity to notice that, which ma- actually matters to us. And then have the courage to pick it up and, and do it. Action. 
as Hannah Arendt would say, the capacity to initiate something new. Thank you very much.